Welcome to the preaching and teaching series of House on the Rock, Lagos, Nigeria. We believe that as you listen to God's Word, you will receive understanding, hope, and faith to become all that God wants you to be. Something is about to happen in your life. And now, here is Pastor Paul and a Pharisee. Matthew 7, 24. Here begins the reading of God's Word. And this is Jesus speaking. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall. Why? Because it was founded on the rock. So he was wise because he heard, took time to hear the word of the Lord and to obey the word of the Lord. On this obedience, wisdom was released. And Jesus said, I liken that man unto a man who built his house on a rock. And the wind, the rain, the storm came massively, but the house refused to fall because it was founded, it was connected, integrated with an immovable rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the same rain, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. I want you to look at three or four people and tell them, when it's all over, I will still be standing. Yeah, life is tough. And trouble and travail really do come. And bad things do happen to good people. But I do want to tell you, after it's come and gone, after it's done and gone, I want to tell you something, which is the word of the Lord. You will make it. You will still be standing. I mean that. I do mean that. Not because you're anything super, but because of what you're connected to that is super. He is immovable. And if you integrate with him, you become as movable as he is. And integration is a function of communication. My subject this morning is simple. Stability through stormy times. Father, bless this word and this people and this time that we share together and use it to, to strengthen our integration with you, our connectivity with you, till in profile, in reality, in experience, in practicalization, we are in the enemy's eyes completely one with you, integrated in you, till we are as immovable as you are. Even so, bless this time and bless this people we pray in Jesus' name. And the people of God said a big amen. Look at somebody as you sit and tell them, I will still be standing. In other words, when it's all over and the storm has beat, the winds have driven, uh, the rain has descended, the flood has ascended, and it's come and gone, I will still be standing. Meaning that when the shaking, the tossing and turning, the testing, the trying, the tribulation, uh, the bereavement, the hell, the bad report, the medical report is all done and gone. Look for me. You will find me. I will still be standing. You may understand this well that when you are not a visible nor a highly profiled person, you can say things and they never get noticed or noted. Uh, but once you are a visible personality with a ubiquitous profile, every little thing that you do or say will be criticized or scrutinized to some significant degree. So that you re recognize now that the hunters uh, only shoot at the antelope that is in the open. They only shoot at the venison that they can see. They don't shoot at the one that's hidden in the obscurity of the bushes. They shoot at the one that is visible. And this has made me, over the years, uh, uh, very particular about ensuring that I am balanced in how I discharge and dispense my homilies, my sermons, and my ministry. I've tried to be balanced to ensure that truth is not taken to extremes because truth taken to extremes 
Christians is where heresy begins. Fanaticism is often truth driven to a wild extreme. And, and in the 30 years of ministry in which I have shared and taught the Word of God at different stages and phases of, of my walk with God and my ministry to His people, I have seen the church vacillate between extremes. Uh, seen too many Christians uh, vacillate between doctrines driven here and there like waves tossed with the sea. And uh, you might remember back in the 80s and the 90s, everybody started preaching about prosperity and started preaching about being blessed uh, and the thing that was in vogue then in the church was name it and claim it blab it and you can grab it Pro profess it and you will possess it and and I embrace the truth in some of that concept which was the aspect that speaks about the fact that life and death are in the power of the tongue however I took exception to some of the invalid extremes to which they took it for example some people would would be coughing and sneezing and phlegm and catarrh be coming out of their nose and you tell them you have a cold and so you know I don't have a cold Cold. Uh, yet they're sneezing. <laughs> And you say, no, I don't have a cold, but, 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 but you do have a cold. And, and please, would you put your hand over your mouth when you sneeze and cough? Because I don't want to catch what you caught, because you do have a cold. Yes, it is a cold. Um, so don't, don't call the things that are, are, that are as if they are not. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, call those things that are not as though they are, not those things that are as though they are not. You have a cold is one reality. You have a healing, that's another reality. And if you feed the upper reality, it will help you to deal with the lower reality. But you do have a cold. And we don't want to catch your cold, so please put your hand over your mouth and, and, and uh, cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze because I don't want the cold too. Or, or you know the other one they do in the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, uh, possess, profess it and possess it thing is they start claiming uh, that he's going to be my husband. He's my husband. I'm going to marry him. And they, they buy the wedding dress. They've written his name on all their, all their stuff, written his name in all their Bibles. Uh, they've picked out their bridesmaids and, and already named the three children he hasn't had for her yet. Uh, and two years later, he doesn't marry her. He marries somebody else. And she's sitting in the wedding still claiming, still blabbing and trying to grab him, Still pro professing and trying to possess him. And two years after that, he has three kids for his real wife. And she's still naming and claiming. Sir, that is not faith. That is witchcraft. <laughs> Anything taken to an extreme is heresy. And because I refuse to join them in the name it and claim it, the blab it and grab it, many doors closed for me in ministry, particularly in certain circles of, of ministry. Because I was one of those few jokers left that was busy preaching suffering and crosses. My ministry was never to the elites or the elitists. My ministry back then and, and still till today was to broken people. My ministry and my message was to hurting people, to hurting houses, to rejected persons, to wounded warriors, to failed friends, to down and out folk, to people who had been, been kicked out of life and uh, uh, ostracized from their social order because of their failure or they had an issue or they had a moral failing or there was something on them. And at that time, my friends, House on the Rock was the classic Adulam ministry. We may not look like Adulam now, but back then we were a bunch of of near-do-wells, didn't get anything right, we were broken, we were struggling, we were sleeping on the floor, we were squatting in a quarrel, quarrel, face me, I face you, we were down and out, or sometimes a few were up and out, but we were an adulam bunch of people who were broke, busted, and disgusted. And the challenge upon that ministry at that time was to take rejects and build them into what people now call elites. And I don't know who it was that suggested that I was a prosperity preacher. If they did, they were very wrong. I have over 2,000 messages out there that I've preached over the last 18 or so years. And most of those messages, the majority of them are on suffering. They're on cr crosses. It's about people like Job or Joseph, not when he was in the palace, but when he was in the pit or in chains in Potiphar's house or in the prison on a false accusation. My message was about people like Mephibosheth in Lodabar or David the broken boy, not David the king, or Paul who had serious suffering and serious failing and serious faltering. I, I, I then preached about crosses more so than I preached about crowns. Not that I negated the message of the crown, but you couldn't get to my crown without first having a cross. And the reason I did that was because I know what life is like. Life is life. 
It happens to everybody, regardless of what you confess. You can name it and claim it all you like, blab it and grab it all you want, profess it and attempt to possess it all you want to. But my friends, you are still going to have to deal with something hard sooner or later. You can do three 40-day fasts in a 365-day year. You can have 30 people praying for you on, a, on an Urioke mountain somewhere in the western part of Nigeria. You can pray 20 hours a day if you like. And you can speak in more tongues than United Nations. But sooner or later, you are still still going to have to deal with something tough in your life. You're going to have to deal with some stuff on your job, some stuff in your marriage, some stuff in your finances, some stuff in your health. If it's not your parents, it's going to be your children. If it's not your children, it's your landlord trying to evict you. If it's not your landlord trying to evict you, your husband has turned into a monster or your wife has turned into a witch or something crazy. That's just life. It's not always demons. Daddy died because he was old. It wasn't auntie who hexed him. Mama passed on and has gone to be with the Lord because she was 96. Sonny boy had a car accident because he was drunk. The Bible said the rain falls on the just, but it also falls on the unjust. The sun shines only on the wicked. No, the sun shines on the righteous and on the unrighteous. I don't care how just you are. It's going to rain on you sooner or later. I don't care how righteous you are. The sun's going to hit you one day or the other. You'll one day sooner or later have to deal with something. And when bad things happen to good people, one of the outcries, the exclamations of people like that is, they cry, why me? I wonder, is there anybody here who's ever had a real situation to deal with where you said, God, why me? If you've never had a why me inside of you, you have never had a trial. And please, that she didn't like your hairdo or didn't, they didn't invite you out to dinner or didn't call you to the dinner party, that's not a trial. I'm talking about a real hellhole. I'm talking about a real issue in your life that threatens to pull out the rock from underneath you, that causes you to feel like life is no longer worth living, that makes you feel like I won't make it to next week or next year, that I don't have but two or three more years left, that I won't survive this. When you go into that kind of trial, the normal response, especially if you are a goody two-shoes or a good person, is to say, God, why me? Can I answer the question for you? You know why you? Because you are alive. Look at somebody and tell them, that's just life. Tell another person, that's just how life is. The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 3, the trying of your faith produces patience. Romans chapter 5 verse 3, tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope or what we call vision. Vision never disappoints. Faith has no way of being tested in your comfort zone. In other words, my dear friend, my dear sister, my dear brother, God is going to allow the enemy to pull you out of your comfort zone. Things are sooner or later going to become massively uncomfortable on one or some or many frontiers of your life. And I want you to be forewarned so that you can be forearmed. So that when hell shows up and knocks on your door with a fury, you don't become shocked at the trial that is to try you. Faith is never proven in the abundance of cars you have in your forecourt or the seven or eight or nine or ten digits you have in your bank account. Faith is not proven by how many diamonds you have in your trinket box faith is not proven by how good you are or how nice things are or how new the car was that you drove off the parking lot my friends faith is proven in trouble faith is proven in tribulation faith is proven in the fiery furnace of affliction faith is proven in the fire Faith is not proven by how, how much money you have or how many houses you own or how many trinkets you have or diamonds you have on your little ring. My friends, the way Job said it was even though you slay me, I still have faith in you. His faith was located in the midst of his season of trial. Faith is proven in your stand. I want you to just help me and, and, and command two or three people and tell them, I know you're going through hell, but stand. <laughs> help me and preach again to another neighbor and tell them, stand, stand. I know they're lying about you, but stand.
stand. I know your best friends have turned into worst enemies, but stand. I know you can't hardly, can't hardly stomach the treachery of a close friend who became a terrible enemy, but stand. I know they're attacking your reputation and maligning your image and trying to pull down at your character. And it feels like you want to hide up underneath an umbrella the way the Pistorius did. But the devil is a liar. If you stand, God will stand for you. But if you falter, you prevent heaven from coming to your defense. Slap somebody another high five and tell them, stand. I know it's not easy. I know you feel weak. I know you feel like throwing in the towel. I know you want to give up sometimes. But my friend, this is not a suggestion. This is not a wishful thought. This is a command from the oracle of God. Stand. Oh, you're still not going to hear me, so I'm going to work you some more. I know you feel like crying. You sometimes feel like dying. And it feels really bad because nobody seems to understand what it feels like to be you. And so you feel lonely in your circumstance. In spite of the fact that you're surrounded by so, by so many hundreds or scores of people, you still feel lonely. Because when you talk to them about your pain and your pressure, your pride and your predicament, nobody seems to feel your pain the way you do. And when nobody's there to support you, my friend you have to find an anchor in something stronger than the people around you that anchor is named Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Mekadesh, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Shama. he's the El Elyon, he's the Adonai he's the bulwark that never fails, the mighty fortress that we call our God, he's the Ebenezer, he's the rock he's the strong tower, he's the name that we call and when we call it there's nothing the enemy can do about it you have to stand Having done all to stand, stand. Because if you stand on him, if they can't knock him down, they won't be able to knock you down. Now, if you're going to obey this, I want you to look for four or five people. Tell them, I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand. Especially if you are a marriage that's going through trial, not in the matrimony, but in your finances, in your health, with your children, or with a circumstance. You need to sometimes talk to each other, especially if you are the husband, and look over at your wife and tell her, honey, I'm going to stand. Looks like I'm failing, it looks like I'm falling, it looks like I'm faltering, it looks like I'm not going to make it. And I know that if I don't make it, the family might not make it. Because if you smite the head, the body's going to be weak. If you hit the shepherd, the flock will scatter. Honey, I want you to know, I may not have much inside of me, but I have much that I'm standing on. I'm standing on a solid rock. Hear me. My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I completely, I wholly leave on Jesus name on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking stand uh, I couldn't stand on my own but because he's my undergirding because he's my substratum baby you better believe it this Negro here he goes stand come what may after it's all said and done I will be standing that's not just a prophecy. That's not just a promise. That's a prophetic reality. I don't care what you're going through right now. You better believe me. After it's come and gone, you'll still be standing. Otherwise, God is not God. He was the one who said it. He's not a man to lie. Neither is he the son of man to relent. If he said it, he'll make it good, baby. You'll still be standing when it's done. Take it from a warrior who came from hell. I've been to hell and back too many times to not know the faithfulness of the word of the God we stand on and the God of the word that we rely on. Still be standing. If you were to count my trials and my woes, my pains and my struggles, the balls that I have to juggle and the more they keep throwing at me, I ought not to be here. But because I'm standing on something that is indefatigable, indomitable, indomitable, irreprehensible, hear me, just absolutely obstinate, absolutely stubborn, I'll still be standing here until my days on earth as originally determined are done. Look for about five people and tell them I'll still be standing. still be standing. Hmm. Jesus said, 
as it concerned the wise man, that he is the one who hears and feeds on the word of God and then does what the word of God that he feeds on says to do. Hear me, my friends. Our forebears had much less word than we do today. They had much less revelation than we have. They had much less truth. They didn't have Holy Ghost or revelation on the level that we do. Yet somehow they stood. Yet somehow they survived. And if they survived, then I know that all you spirit-filled saints, Bible token, Bible talking, tongue talking, spirit filled, Bible knowing, saints of God, somehow you are going to make it. The wise man was only considered wise by the master because he was a hearer and a doer of the prophetic pronouncement of God. Do you know that you can be a Christian and not be hearing and not be doing the word that you hear? And I'm not saying that you are demonic or that that this is necessarily sin because sometimes it is not. It's just the cares of this world, the pressures of life, the balls you have to juggle, the stewardships you have to deal with, the responsibility and the burdens of being husband and being father, not just to your four or your five, but to scores and scores of people, having to deal with all kinds of pressures in, a, in an undulating, vacillating economy, with all kinds of enemies because of your meteoric rise, with all kinds of issues on every side, uh, and all that sits down on you. And in spite of your cares, you still have to deal with life. Till the cares of this world start choking out the word of God. So that you are now just as scared as the world. Just as nervous as the world. Just as stricken with anxiety and panic attacks as the world. Just as disbelieving and doubtful as the world. My friends, Jesus did not teach this shake and bake faith message that I hear them preach around today. That if you really walk with God, nothing bad will ever happen to you. Jesus said, if you have the word and you hear the word and you do the word, you will be like a man who built his house on the rock. But in spite of your house being built on the rock, the rain will still come and descend upon your house. The floods will still arise and beat upon the house. The winds will still blow and barrage your house. The storm will still mightily come against your house. In other words, just because you built it on a rock doesn't mean nothing bad is going to happen to you. Hell will still fall fight you to test and see whether you are built on sand or whether you are built on the immovable rock. Uh, you'll know that you are built on the rock, not just because, no, rather not because you didn't go through hell, uh, but because after all you went through, you are still standing. Oh, I know I'm going to have to work. Somebody's going to make me work this morning. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you did what the word said to do. You did what God wanted you to do. You spent time seeking out a spiritual place to hear an anointed word from the almighty God. You made sure that your preacher was an anointed preacher. And when you heard your preacher preach uh, the word of God, you went to check it to make sure it was in the word of God. And when you did, you resolved in your mind to do the word of God. And after you did it, you felt now I'll be able to take anything. Uh, but after you built your house on the rock uh, all hell broke loose uh, and the good news that I have for you is look back upon your life uh, look at the hell you had to suffer look at the crosses you had to carry look at the attacks you had to endure look at the perseverance with which you had to persevere but are you gone are you disappeared or are you still here look at somebody for me tell them I'm still standing I had to suffer my spouse going through all kinds of hell and then bury her in a six foot tomb and then still have to come to church and worship God. My friends, I must be a warrior because I'm still standing. If you're looking for somebody to marry, it's gonna be somebody like me because after all I went through, I took a licking but I'm still ticking. I heard bad news but I still have a good attitude. They put me in the fire but I refused to burn. I went in as gold ore but but I came out as fine gold. You know why? Because I'm connected to something that is indestructible. I am still standing. Now all of you who fell down, all of you who failed and never got up, all of you who took hits and it knocked you out for the count, I want you to sit down. But the rest of you who took a licking, but you're still here, I want you to shout, I am still standing. 
I should be dead by now, but I'm still standing. I should be a number by now, but I'm still standing. There should be a tombstone over my head, but I'm still standing. They should have written me off as a failure, as a never do well, but the devil is a liar. Look at me. I got my two hands, my ten fingers. I got my anointing. I still got my praise. I'm still standing. I didn't really hear you. That, that I'm still standing sounded like a little perfunctory little whisper. If you're still standing, I want you to shout it. Now the person beside you doesn't know what that means because they don't know what you went through. They don't know what you had to deal with. Because you know why? When we come to church, we're all covered up. We sprayed nice boo boo bar perfume. We put on our best suit, our best tie, our best dress, our best weave on, our best Brazil or Colombia or whatever you call that stuff. We put on our best pose, our best posture. We speak our best tongue. And right now we speak the tongues with phonetics. But you never know what we're standing through. But look at your neighbor and tell them, I've been through something. But I'm still standing. And I have something I want to give you. In the military, People who've been through something, we give them promotions. When you see a senior officer, it's a sign he's been through stuff you haven't been through. And when we come up across them, we do something like this. I salute you. I salute you. All of you who are still standing, I salute you. I salute you. I said, I salute you. I give you what they call compliments because you bad. To have done what you did, come through what you came through, there's something about you that doesn't meet the eye plainly. Oh, oh, look at something. You don't know what I had to come through. Because you see, that nice suit can be deceptive. That nice smile, it can be a deception. That lovely gait, that nice, nice strut, the way they, they smile, you don't know what they had to suffer. You have no idea. And sometimes it's physical pain. But sometimes it's not physical pain. And I don't know which is worse, emotional pain or physical pain. But I do know that when it's emotional pain and physical pain at the same time, there's not much like it. Then financial pain, then marital pain, then pain over your children, then pain over your parents, then pain over your life, then pain over false accusation. Then it sometimes all comes together. And I'm still standing. You must know I'm bad. I'm bad. In fact, what you need to do, you need to beat your own chest and say, I'm bad. Sit for a moment. Let's go a little further. The wise man and the foolish man both had a lot in common. They both built something great. They both had phenomenal accomplishments. They both had shelter systems as refuge for their stormy times. Externally, you couldn't tell that there was any difference. They both had to deal with the storm. They both had to deal with the lightning, the flashing, the thunder, the billowing, the beating of the rain, the beating of the storm. And the wise man, if he had spoken too soon, would have said, being righteous just doesn't pay. Because I understand when the rain and the trouble and the hell beats on the house of the unrighteous man. But what I don't understand is when it beats on my house too. Because it's beating on his house I understand that, but when it starts beating on my house, I don't. Because I know he deserves his trouble, but I don't think I deserve any trouble. And he now exclaims, God, it's unfair. I understand why you should beat up on him, but you ought not to beat up on me. Quiet! It's not over yet, wise man. You cannot judge anything in the middle of a storm. The worst time to make a decision is in a storm. You can't even trust your own mind in the middle of a storm. You can't depend on your own judgment in the middle of a storm. So what do you do in the middle of a storm? Just stand. And at that, stand still and ride out the storm. Help me and look at somebody. Tell them, I am not worried. In other words, I am going to be all right. I'm not worried about tomorrow. Yes, I may have to deal with some discomfort. Yes, I may have to deal with some trouble. Yes, I may have to deal with some losses. But when it's all said and done, come and gone, I will still be standing. 
I may lose some shutters. I may lose some roof shingles. I may lose some windows. I may lose some roofing sheets. But after the storm has come and gone, I will still be standing. Look, look at me. I lost my husband, but I still made it. I lost my job, but I still made it. I lost my baby at two years old, but I still made it. I had to move in with my sister. That was not comfortable, but I still made it. I lost my dog and my cat, but I still made it. If the difference between the wise and the foolish is in hearing the word and doing the word, that means we are wise when we are fed from a spiritual place. That means a wise man seeks out a spiritual place and carves it into the normal routine of his life. So that he recognizes that man does not thrive on paychecks and salaries or bread and cake alone. But man thrives on the word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so he ensures that he has a spiritual place that he doesn't compromise. He doesn't just go there once in a month. He makes sure that all day long he has something that he's listening to. He's listening to a media a media that feeds him the word of God. Not what God said, but what God is saying. He's always in tune with a relevant re revelationary word to his life. Because in the world, you will always hear the media and the medium of the world's trends. And the world's trends, if that's all you feed on, you will trend like the world. And whatever's trending in the world will be what happens to you. But a wise man, he gets up early to be in the house of God on Sunday morning. And on Monday and Tuesday when there's no church, he'll make a church out of his bedroom, out of his car, out of his bathroom, out of uh, the, the pre-work hours in his office and ensure that he's in a place to hear from God. Because he recognizes that if you don't keep hearing from God, your life will conform to whatever's going on in the world. But my friends... I don't have to wait for God to bless the world for me to be blessed. Because God can be cursing the world, but because I'm in tune with him, he can bless me whilst the world is being cursed. So whilst it's raining on the world, and it's raining on me, there's still a blessing in the midst of the rain. Romans 12 and verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that acceptable, good, and perfect will of God. What does he mean? You are a form and whatever comes into you informs you. It determines your form, determines your opinions, your dispositions, your perspectives and how you see things. 